Sorry, in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather together here. We ask you, God, to enlighten our minds and our hearts to hear your word. We ask you, God, to give us uh, uh, a spirit of, uh, of, of learning, a spirit of, of knowledge, so that we can uh, take in the, the information that we have here, and not only to take it in as, as information for our minds, but to apply it into our hearts, into our souls, into our everyday lives. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to, to learn from and to, to pray using icons. And we ask you, God, to help us to strengthen our relationship uh, to the saints, thereby uh, strengthening our relationship to you. Through the inception of St. Mary, St. Marie, and all your saints, hear us when you pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Free us our trespasses, which pass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but us from the evil one. For Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Okay, so welcome everyone to Iconography Day. Uh, we are very blessed to be able to spend this time together in fellowship. Iconography Day is an event led by the OCCM Evangelism Committee to learn about one of the most beautiful aspects of our Coptic Orthodox Church. Uh, we're first going to start off by a presentation given by Dr. Laura Homan. Dr. Homan earned her PhD from the Catholic University of America in 2016 with a focus in religious and cultural history, as well as an expanded interest in the Reformation era of the Mediterranean world. She is currently a professor at Trevecca University in Nashville, Tennessee. After this presentation, we'll follow a video tutorial by UK Coptic Icons. This video will give us a chance to draw the face of Christ and teach us basic features of Coptic icons. After this, we'll conclude with a spiritual word from the mouth of Father Theodore Lely, teaching us the spirituality behind icons. So whenever... Cool. No, you, you you did everything I wanted to. I was just gonna I was just gonna sort of introduce Dr. Holman. Dr. Holman, is, yeah, you said all the you said all the fancy stuff about her credentials and everything like that. But I just wanted to sort of uh, give her uh, give her some credit and some props. She she's been really helpful. Uh, we've done this, I think, maybe three four years now. Um, uh, you sort of like tell, telling us about Coptic iconography from uh, from a, an academic standpoint, and uh, I think it's been really helpful. And, and she's uh, been so generous to take up of her time to sort of be with us at Trevecca. We've done it, I think, Nashville wide, and now we're doing it diocese wide. So I just wanted to say a thank you to to Dr. Holman, and uh, I guess I'll give you the floor. Thanks, guys. That was great. I, I feel so special in COVID. <laughs> you don't do a lot of these conference things. That's great. I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, I just submitted somebody, sorry. <laughs> and sharing my screen. Make you guys bigger so I can see as many of you as possible. Okay. All right, is that working for you guys? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. So, right, I am, as you guys have said, I'm a historian and I focus on religious uh, history. I'm not an art historian, but I'm fascinated by iconography and religious history. I do mostly focus on Europe, so the West, and I have used these yearly iconography days with your Coptic communities to get to learn a little bit more about Coptic art specifically. So every year I give this, I get more and more specific by the end, looking at your traditions and past. Even before kind of connecting with community, I've always been very interested in Coptic iconography because as you'll find out later in this mini lecture, um, you guys have the oldest stuff. <laughs> you have the oldest stuff in the East. A lot of the Byzantine stuff was destroyed. And I've always kind of seen it in passing as like, and then the Egyptians saved it. <laughs> so I was always interested in it. I've used this as an opportunity to get to know a little more about it. Um, so I'll walk you through kind of general where icons come from and their role in the historical church. And then by the end, we'll zero in a little bit more on the Coptic tradition. Okay, so let's go back. I said I'm going to the beginning here. Um, go back to Jesus. Uh, the first three centuries of Christianity were during times of persecution. And it's a little misunderstood. It wasn't constant persecution. It's actually a little uncertain which Roman emperors persecuted Christians in a large scale way. The first evidence that an emperor was trying to persecute Christians is under Emperor Nero after the 64 AD fire in Rome. He started to get blamed, and so he had to find a scapegoat, and he labeled Christians and started a really horrific but regional persecution around Rome of Christians. Horrible stories about burning them alive in his gardens, putting meat on them and feeding them to his dogs, like really tough stuff, but mostly in the city of Rome around a certain event. 
We also have some evidence going to Emperor Trajan, who's ironically one of the five good emperors, that's his name for history, but he also was a persecutor of Christians and it looked different. He basically said, if you're accused of Christianity, you've got to go to court. If we find you guilty of Christianity you and you refuse to recant, you are executed. Um, but if you say, I'm not a Christian, you go free. And this is a really interesting time in the second century for Christians because you could kind of just be like, I don't believe in Jesus and then run to church and feel okay and you survive. But then you're going to church with somebody whose grandma is no longer with us because she refuses to recant Jesus. And it's a real kind of divisive time. Um, the probably most well-known largest scale persecution is under Emperor Diocletian and his co-emperor uh, Galerius. And that starts around 303 and goes till 313. This is the largest scale persecution taking place all over the Roman Empire, all over the Mediterranean world, um, and then ends with a total reversal with the life of Constantine, which I'll mention in a minute. So during these centuries of Christian persecution, Christians are not meeting in churches or basilicas. They don't really have time to figure out theology or they don't have schools and universities to be trained in. They don't even have the canonized New Testament. They have this much theology and yet they're giving their lives for this faith. And so, uh, and Tertullian is an early church theologian and philosopher who says the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The church is growing exponentially, even though it's being persecuted. So to look at what did icons, what religious art look like in this persecuted earliest church, we go to the catacombs. And you guys have probably heard of catacombs. They are underground burial chambers. They're not intrinsically Christian. Uh, nobles use them to bury their family members. But um, these are important because this is where we see the earliest Christian art is underground where people are being buried. Now, people aren't really having church in these places. There's decomposing bodies here, but they are having little ceremonies around the dead. And these are some of the early images. Um, usually I like to participate. It's kind of awkward over Zoom, but I'll just try it. Anyone want to throw out what they're looking at? Can you tell what some of these images are? What did persecution, persecute Christians image? Top right is Jonah. Ah, top right is Jonah. Usually people don't get that one because it's weird like serpent thing, but yeah, good. It's actually one of my favorite um, icons, the Jonah. Oh, yeah, good. So I got it. Any others? The top left is the three fiery youth. Yeah, Shadok, Meshach, and Abednego, good. Maybe one more. Is Bottom the right is Noah. Bottom night right is Noah in a cardboard box. Good. <laughs> oh, I heard someone else. Who else said it? I was going to say the bottom right. Yeah. Ah, good. Okay. And then we've got David, the shepherd king. Um, anyone know this one? Bottom left. A little trickier. Different perspective than you'll see in later iconography of these two. Who would be carrying wood on his back and following his dad up a mountain? Isaac. Isaac. Ah, Isaac. Good. Isaac and Abraham. Good. So if you're seeing a pattern here, these are all Old Testament stories. Again, like I mentioned, they don't have a canonized New Testament. And there's a real confusion over how to depict Jesus because he's a God man, right? He's fully God, fully man. How do you depict a God man? And how do you do it without leading into some kind of idolatry or being too much like the Greeks and Romans? There's also some iconography in the, in the catacombs that are not representational, they're symbolic, like the fish where people and moms still put on their SUVs sometimes, which is an acronym for Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. There's an anchor, especially um, impactful symbol for Christians feeling like they're in a storm at sea, but God is the anchor, the peace. And then of course the Cairo, the first two letters of Christos in Greek. These early uh, art forms show us a little bit about what persecuted Christians, early Christians thought were encouraging, which were didactic, which were teaching them a little bit about their faith and their history. We historians look at these images too for insights into what the Christian community looked like and how they thought about each other themselves. So my favorite catacomb is the catacomb of Priscilla. Priscilla is a wealthy Christian woman who dedicates her whole family catacombs, all of her land to the Christian community and they just keep expanding it. Last I looked, they found over 40,000 graves on her property in her catacombs that she gave to the Christians to use. And there's this beautiful little chapel, the Greek chapel. You can see right above, can you see my cursor by the way? I'm pointing every, okay, great. You can see here, there, there's that David Shepherd that I showed in the previous slide. And below him is this woman. We don't think she, we don't know who she is. She's not a known saint. She might just be a regular Christian who 
who lived during this time. And these are signs of her life. Here, she is robed next to her husband and getting married. The priest is interestingly sitting, sitting on a stool in front of her and marrying her. Here, she's had her baby. It's interesting, she's sitting on this chair. And this is, sorry, I'm already getting graphic here, but this is how women used to give birth. They would sit on a chair with a hole in it and give birth like through the hole. I don't need to say anymore, but there we go. So she's sitting on her birth chair and perhaps nursing her baby. These are important moments in her life. And then here she is praying with her arms outstretched, wearing a fancy outfit. This is supposed to be her glorified body, that this is here she was as a woman and not even really focusing on her especially spiritual moments. It's her moments in her life that kind of identified her in the community. And then here she is in glory, praising God. Uh, we also have, this is perhaps the first um, Eucharist setting. There's not 12 here. We don't necessarily think this is supposed to be depicting the first Lord's Supper. We don't really know. It might just be feasting. We know the early church used sharing of bread, breaking bread, feasting as kind of a community builder in these home churches. So it might just be one of those. It might be an example of an early home church doing some kind of Eucharist tradition. And this image in the middle is perhaps the earliest image we have of the Virgin Mary nursing baby Jesus. So here are our earliest images. Again, nothing depicting God, Trinity, Jesus, a real worry, concern, confusion about how to do that. But a lot of representation of people doing the faith, working, moving and stepping in the movement of God. So everything changes in history <laughs> in 313 with Constantine. Emperor Constantine has this remarkable journey. Uh, we think his mom was a Christian, he converts to Christianity, and he goes on this crusading uh, attempt to retake the empire. He's not in line for the throne. At this point, the empire has been divided in two, and east and west. He tries to conquer the entire thing, and he does, and it takes him two decades, but he does. And his first act when he takes over the western half of the Roman Empire and stands in Rome is he, it, uh, he issues the Edict of Milan, which is an issuance of religious tolerance. And this is the end of Christian persecutions. He then publicly converts himself to Christianity and starts sponsoring the Christian church. This is when we start to see the earliest church councils like the 325 Council of Nicaea. This is when we start to see churches meeting in official churches and basilicas that had been, they, they claimed uh, Roman government buildings for their own to meet in massive churches. We start to see a lot more money getting poured into the church and a lot more intentionality behind canonizing scripture and developing theology. We also see the rise of monasticism. Some people who don't really even recognize this politicized a little bit, wealthy a little bit church. And we see people go off to be hermits or join monastic communities in both the East and the West. Of course, Egypt is famous for incredible um, pious monks uh, like St. Anthony. And in the meantime, um, as the Roman Empire starts to collapse in the fourth into the fifth century and starts to divide, we start to have a slow division between the Catholic West and the Orthodox East. Of course, I'm simplifying this, but over time, I mean, all the stuff I've been talking about, there's just one kind of developing Christian Christianity in the Roman Empire. Um, but then as the Western part, so Italy, the continent, um, Northern Africa, starts to split from the Greek-speaking Eastern part, we start to see some divergences in the two churches, which will be solidified by the end of the Middle Ages. So as they're kind of dealing with how do we image Christianity and the saints and the Trinity, there's a lot of concern, obviously, for the Ten Commandments and the no graven images. Um, a worry about what does that look like? Clearly, we're not intending to commit idolatry here, but is there a way to somehow imagine, image, um, honor the saints and Christ? And uh, early theologians were kind of divided on it, some questions about it. Tertullian is wondering, are they idols? Are they, Augustine is saying they're so flawed, are they even really helpful? Maybe they're forgeries. The biggest advocate for icons comes from the East, John of Damascus who's actually living under Muslim control at this point in Damascus. And he writes two incredible works. One of them is called On Holy Images. And he says this, for the invisible things of God since the creation of the world are made visible through images. So basically God has always used images to reveal himself. We see images in creation, which remind us faintly of God. As when, for instance, we speak of the holy and adorable Trinity imaged by the sun or light or burning rays or by a running fountain or a full river or by the mind speech or the spirit within us or by a rose tree or sprouting flower or sweet fragrance. 
we use images, we look at the physical world and it gives us an insight into God. It's not perfect, but that doesn't mean it's flawed. It just means it's a picture, a shadow of what is true. And he kind of makes the point that God has always used this to speak to his people. Images are not just a, a nice thing on the side. They're an essential part of how God calls us to worship. So not only are early Christians a little worried about the idol thing and kind of divided on how to stay away from that, but they're also worried about looking too pagan. The Greeks, the Romans, they had shrines, they have temples, they have sculptures, they have paintings, they have things that they bring to their gods and goddesses. They worship these images. And they're really worried once we start depicting divine beings, how do we make them look divine without making them look pagan divine? So they come up with this strategy that will work throughout the ancient medieval world and still to today, especially in Coptic iconography, is to avoid being too natural, too specific. Also to not focus on the skill of the artist, him or herself, but to focus on the creator and the one that you are worshiping through this imagery. Using these images, the, this religious art as an act of worship in itself. Um, and to really stay much more stylized and symbolic with the imagery rather than trying to get down to the, every little tendon and vein and every time that kind of realistic feature. So what does that look like in the West? So these are the people I'm going to study. Um, boo, West, I know that's not your world, but this is what I study, and then I'm going to go to your world. Um, so in the West, icons are pretty much fully embraced um, without any periods of uh, iconoclastic moments, which we'll talk about in a minute. They certainly have moments in their history where there's not a lot of icon production because after the fall of the Western half of the Roman Empire, they go into basically a, a, a dark period in terms of artistic production. But for the most part, popes, bishops, spiritual leaders in the West always use some kind of religious art. Gregory the Great is a famous pope right around the year 600, dealing with a really impoverished, divided Europe. And he talks about how images are the Bible for the poor. He specifically encourages icons to teach the illiterate and to teach those who can't read scripture. He thinks it is the Christian call to reach everyone. And this is an essential part of that call. So he doesn't so much focus on the same way as John Damascus is this essential for everyone's worship, but he basically says it's the outreach to the poor. It's the outreach to the illiterate and we can't ignore it. But from about 400 to 700, there's very little icon production because um, Europe is mostly taken over by um, heretical Aryan Christians. There's a lot of civil war and division and not a lot of art production in general. But after 700, when we see the Carolingian Empire, and those are the people I specifically study for my research, they take over most of continental Europe and they start a Renaissance period where they intentionally do a lot of book production, image production, iconography. And these are some examples of that with really elaborate uh, gospel books, theology books, that are filled with written images, um, mostly in books. So not so much adorning walls of churches, but in the books that were treasures for these communities. Now in the West, of course, we're skipping way ahead, but I wanna go back to the East, but just so you know, they do have an iconoclastic movement in a way. The Catholic church is always supportive of icons, but in the 1500s with the Protestant Reformation, most of the Protestant traditions are anti-icons. They see these saint shrines as just one more example of the Catholic Church getting distracted by non-essentials, Martin Luther's whole thing about going back to scripture and scripture alone. Um, and we see here some images, especially this one on the right, of these saints almost looking like they're burning people, but these are burning saint shrines and icons and sculptures of saints. And these Protestant churches are completely stripped down of all kind of iconography in the West. So even though the Catholic Church continues to support um, icons, the Protestant church will not. Okay, so let's go to the East in the Byzantine Empire and the growing Greek Orthodox Church. It is, icon work is fully embraced in the earliest periods after Constantine, but they go through two periods of iconoclasm in the 8th and 9th century. So for most of the 700s and the first half of the 800s, there's an intentional effort from the patriarch and emperor down to destroy icons, not just stop creating them, but to find them and destroy them. Some of them are kind of painted over and art historians have been able to restore some of them. Some of them were crushed, destroyed, um, burned. Part, there's a lot of reasons this, but one of the reasons is this is the time of massive Islamic invasions coming out of Saudi Arabia. 
Um, in about 150 years, uh, Muslim invasions take over all the near and Middle East, all of North Africa, all of Spain. And the Byzantine Empire is cut in half and is facing extinction. And they're wondering what they did to anger God. And they kind of come up with this theory that maybe it's these icons. We've always kind of been a little worried about them anyway, and maybe this is the reason. And so they basically do this as an effort to please God and stop the onslaught of invasions. Um, it is eventually stopped. People agree that this was not what was the problem to begin with, and icons are continuing to produce after that point. But as a result, we have very few Greek Orthodox icons from before the ninth century because almost all of them were destroyed. And this is where Egypt comes in. <laughs> Egypt at this point had already been overtaken by the Muslim invasions. They were not under Byzantine control. So they were not facing the same kind of destruction. Now, Muslims are against any kind of representational art, but Muslims had both Christians and Jews under this kind of dini status, this protected status. It gave them a lot of limitations. They issued extra taxes against them. They didn't allow them to proselytize, but they did allow small Christian communities to continue. So even though there is some destruction under the Muslim invasions, there are still Coptic churches that have early icons that were not touched by the Byzantine iconoclasm and not touched by the Muslim iconoclasm. The most famous example and the place that is on my bucket list to go someday, please tell me if any of you have been, but St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai, anybody? It's like super remote, I hear. Anthony, you been? Tony, you been? Yes, I actually, I was there ah. in 2017. Oh my goodness, okay. Okay, so part of the reason why it was so well preserved is because it's in the middle of nowhere. And Tony, add on to this, if you have anything to add. It's in the middle of nowhere. No one really wanted to go into the middle of Sinai Desert to find this place. And it today has the largest collection of early medieval late antique iconography, as well as a ton of manuscripts there. So they just have an incredible collection. And so a lot of the images I'm gonna show you, I give a shout out to St. Catherine's Monastery because that's the only place that these images were preserved and found. Um, and why Egypt, there's also, of course, and you guys probably know this better than I do, but there are some divides, obviously, between the Greek Orthodox world and the Coptic Christian world. You have some disagreements on the Council of Chalcedon, for example, but for the most part, you guys preserved it because you just were not still under Byzantine control and kind of were living a different life during this iconoclasm moment. So I love to look at this, these two images in the bottom. These are some of the earliest, and whenever you're seeing 6th century, 7th century, these don't exist in the East outside of Egypt. Here is the Virgin with child between St. Theodore and St. George. This is found in the Monastery of St. Catherine. It's perhaps the oldest Eastern Virgin Mary icon that we have. So we saw that icon in the catacombs that was based in Rome. I should have said that Priscilla's catacomb is in Rome. But this is perhaps the earliest image of Mary, which I know you guys have a lot of icons and it might look a little different than the Mary you see today, but here is the beginnings of it. And then this one is maybe my favorite. This is Christ the Savior, also from St. Catherine's, um, also super old and perhaps the oldest Byzantine Eastern uh, Christ icon. And what I love about this, and this is when I teach mostly Protestants at Trevecca about icons, I like to use this as an example, because this is, I think, an example, he, he looks very realistic. There's incredible detail to this icon, but it might look a little strange to you looking at him straight in the eyes because his eyes are different. He's intentionally created so that his face is different right down the middle. One side of the face looks different than the other. This is an attempt to try to depict Jesus with his two natures, fully God, fully man. How do you do that? So one example is to make one being who has two different faces, non-symmetrical, two sides of his face, to try to image the two natures. Love this stuff. Christ and Abbot Mina, a little bit older. This is from the monastery of Bowit, oh, Egypt. Um, and this is perhaps the oldest Coptic, Icon, so that we know what's created in Egypt by an Orthodox church. So Coptic imagery is unique. Not only is it unique because you guys have a lot of the oldest images, but also because you, your people created imagery that was very much based on the art of their world, of the Egyptian world. So, and that means non-religious, not Christian art that they were influenced by. So one example is from the Fayum mummy portraits. These are portraits of the dead that were very popular for a long time in Egyptian history. Egyptians are kind of known for figuring out how to do things really well early on, and then they just keep doing it the same way. And so here we have from 50 to 850, these mummy portraits. And you can see they have the long skinny noses, the long thin faces, the large eyes. 
this is how the Egyptians portrayed their people and their dead. And that is also what we see in icon imagery in Coptic church even today, those basic features. We also see that they are influenced by um, the Egyptian art of the pharaohs and pagan religion. Um, I was listening to a lecture that is in the um, Library of Congress archives about from a Byzantine or a, sorry, a Coptic iconographer. And she was talking about how in some ways the Egyptians were actually really used to seeing a God being nursed, like that idea of a God in baby form because they had examples from Isis and infant Horus. This image is a pagan image of a mom nursing her son who's divine. And they kind of were comfortable immediately depicting Mary also nursing as like a, a religious art they're used to seeing. And then of course, the Coptic cross is very similar to the Anx that was used in pagan art. It's used to describe new life and the Coptic Christians turned it and used it for their own theology in their own unique Egyptian play on the cross symbol. So icons have symbols that you can read. So again, because they're stylized, you're, there are ways to always see who you're looking at. There are certain attributes that every saint always has, which you guys might have already just noticed, even if you didn't, weren't taught that intentionally from your own icons in your churches. So as you've seen, these icons can be a range of materials. There's icons in books, there's icons on parchment carved into marble and ivory and wood. Um, gemstones, people would wear them as emblems or amulets or, or necklaces. And these attributes, they often had halos to depict their divinity. They had attributes such as, for example, these two images on the right. Anyone know who that is? Oh, I show you. Never mind, I already say it. But it's St. Peter. And St. Peter, this is a modern Coptic uh, icon. And this is a sixth century icon of Peter. So <laughs> much, distant, much, much distant in creation. But look, both Peters have white or gray hair. Usually it's a little wavy. He's got a wavy beard, also gray. He is often holding a scroll and always holding keys because Christ gave him the keys uh, with his uh, declaration of who God was or who Christ was, that he was God. We often see also icons that have this three finger sign of blessing, also a sign of the Trinity. So these kinds of symbolic moments in these icons are because again, they're not supposed to be perfectly representational. They're also supposed to be symbolic loaded with meaning. And then the last point I wanna make is just to look at more modern Coptic imagery and where it comes from. So Coptic art looks very similar for centuries, but then it starts to change in the early modern period. Egypt is occupied by Britain for a long time. There's a lot of Western influences. It kind of becomes more popular to kind of just embrace Western style of religious art. And the traditions of the Coptic world start to disappear. And then after the 1952 revolution, a lot of artists and scholars flee Egypt and the state starts sponsoring kind of very prescribed formulaic art and it almost looks like the Coptic tradition of icon making in their own unique historic form dies. It's gonna die. Until we have Isaac Fanus, who is known as the father of Neo-Coptic iconography, who basically revives the tradition. And a lot of the images you have today are either by him or influenced by him. He studies the stuff we've just been learning about and all these early precursors to Egyptian Coptic art and, and kind of the height of Coptic art and tries to reinterpret it for his current context. He is followed by many other iconographers. The other two that I was finding in my research are very popular is Bedar Latif and Youssef Nasif. This is a wife-husband duo that we're working out of the Institute for Coptic Studies in Cairo. And they also continue to add on tradition in the same time period, the 50s and 60s of this last century. And they're the ones that are kind of taking, these are just some examples. So we have some of the icons that they were finding in manuscript art and churches and in monasteries. And then they were kind of doing their own interpretation on it. Still taking these kind of larger eyes, longer face, longer nose, but sometimes merging different stories, different scenes from different uh, historical art and um, adding a little bit more vibrancy of colors, clarifying some of the, the narratives and some of the stories. Um, and putting in their new spin on, on kind of more modern Coptic art that's still very historical and true to their roots and true to their heritage. And then I just want to end with a prayer that kind of ends me and starts the next phase. But as you guys know, icons are written, right? They are an act of worship that people entered into icon making, which you're about to do as an honor for them and glory to God, as something that they do with an intentionality 
that informs their faith and is an expression of their faith. So there are often in icon workshops rules for being a good icon writer, that there are there's confession involved and intentionality involved and prayers involved. So if I'm allowed with all these holy people in here, I will say a quick prayer reading it. Um, and then I'll let, I think Tony, you're going to take over with the video next. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. So I'll pray for us. O divine Lord of all that exists, enlighten and direct my soul, my heart, and my spirit. Guide the hands of your unworthy servants so that we may worthily and perfectly portray your icons, that of your mother and of the saints, and for the glory and joy and adornment of your holy church. Forgive us our sins and the sins of those who will venerate these icons and who kneeling devoutly before them give homage to those they represent. Protect them from all evil and instruct them with good counsel. This I ask through the intercessions of your most holy mother and all your saints. Amen. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Homan, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think a lot of us are, I mean, me at least, when you're giving that presentation, I was, I was filled with an overwhelming sense of pride um, just because of how much uh, rich tradition our church carries. Uh, and I want to just thank you again. Um, so now I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get into the art portion of this. So give me one. Thank you, Dr. Homan. This was really wonderful. I, uh, I must admit, thanks for sharing all this. Um, and actually, the video that Tony is about to show uh, by Fadi Mikhail. Fadi was a student of uh, Dr. Isaac Fanus. And uh, yep, and uh, he's the one that founded the UK Coptic Icons. I did meet him years ago, uh, back in the days. Um, he's really wonderful. And I also must add, I grew up in Atlanta, and uh, St. Mary's Coptic Church in Atlanta, uh, the icons are written by Bedour and uh, Yusuf. Wow. Is it, uh, is it Yusuf? That was his name? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's so I remember, I remember uh, a while back when they came, I don't remember how old I was, but they came to Atlanta and they, um, and they stayed for a long time with us and they wrote the icons there. So it was such a great blessing and a uh, lovely thing. And I remember actually I was teaching, I was serving uh, third and fourth grade Sunday school at that time. Huh. And the patron saint of the class was uh, Saint Ephraim the Syrian. So they wrote me a little icon. Ah. I still have it until now. I hope you have it. Yeah, I still do. I still do. Yeah, oh, so that's great. It was very lovely to, um, you know, to, to see you, to hear you um, mention them too. Yes. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Roman. All right, Tony, it's all yours. Okay. So if everyone has their paper, a ruler, a compass, and a pencil. So how this is going to work is I'm going to play the video. And um, if you... If you fall behind, just you know, uh, say something and then I can pause and rewind it. But hopefully you can play it through. In the beginning, I'll pause it just because the beginning is a lot of uh, measurements. So hopefully by the middle of it, we'll be able to continuously have the video playing through. Um, all right, here we go. Icons are a way in which we can see with our human eyes what the Spirit of God always sees. The eyes that God gave us will one day see men and women and even the rest of creation shining with the glory of God, glowing with the light of God. We hope you enjoy this tutorial video learning about how to create the most important feature of an icon, the face of Christ. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for this tutorial on how to draw the face in a Coptic icon. My name is Ferdi McHale of UK Coptic Icons. Please do let me know how you feel about the video, maybe leave me a comment in the comment section. Apart from that, let's get started. You'll need a pencil, preferably HB. You'll need a ruler. You'll need an eraser or rubber. And if you have one, you could really do with one of these. A compass. So now that we've got these, let's get started. The first thing I'd actually like to do is split the page down the middle vertically by drawing a line down the middle. Now you can either do that by folding your sheet and then unfolding it and when you've unfolded it you'll see the middle line or you can take a ruler and measure the width of your paper 
and cut in half. So my paper is about 20. I'm going to put point at 10 and another one down here at 10 and I'm going to join them up with a vertical line. There they are. It doesn't need to be too dark because we're going to rub it out uh, in the future. Now, because I'm using an A4 piece of paper in the UK, um, I'm going to try and get my first circle, which is going to be the circle for the halo, um, very close to the edge, not right up to the edge, with a bit of a frame. Um, so in my case, it's going to be 18 centimetres from edge to edge. So I need to draw a radius of 9 centimetres, which is half of 18. There's my 9. I'm going to just put my compass point in the centre of the page on the vertical line. And just keep a note that this, this circle is being drawn near the top of the page, not in the very centre of the page. That's because once we draw the figure of Christ, we're going to give him some shoulders to make sure that he looks um, looks like he's actually got shoulders. Right, so that's my... Okay, so we're going to pause it here, just so that everyone can get that circle drawn. of 18 centimeters diameter for the halo. The next thing I want to do is actually draw the face circle in size. Now, the proportions of the face to the halo, we usually make the face about two thirds or just smaller than two thirds of this size. So if this is 18, two thirds would be 12, which means the radius will be six. I'm actually going to make it slightly smaller by making it a radius of five and a half. So I'm going to measure my five and a half. Use the same centre as I did before. And there is the face circle for me. So that will be the circle we use to create the face and the hair. The outer circle is for the halo. So now we've got those two circles. I want you to take your pencil. Okay, we'll just give everyone a couple more seconds to do that. Just like I said before, the beginning is a lot of measurements but it gets easier afterwards. I see some people are still working, so give a few more seconds. And the measurements were nine centimeters um, and then 5.5. And through the center point where you used your compass, draw a horizontal line through the circles, like so. Now you've got a vertical and a horizontal. The next thing to do is between that middle point and the bottom of the small circle, I want you to imagine where the middle point is and just make a horizontal mark. And again, between that horizontal mark you've just made and the bottom of the small circle, Imagine where the middle point is, and just above that, by a little way, make a mark. That will be where our mouth will be. And now for the next bit, putting the eyes and the eyebrows in, it just gets a little bit more complicated because we're going to put some markers in. Um, now between this point, which is the outer left part of the smaller circle, and the middle part, I want you to try and divide this space into three equal parts. Just guessing it. So if you put a mark there, say, and a mark there, that's almost three equal parts. I'm going to just move this point slightly this way and erase that first point I made. I'd say that's about three equal parts from here to there. And do the same on the other side. 
If you want, you can use your ruler and measure this accurately, but you don't have to. Just doing it like this would be fine. Then this segment from here to here, this line, I want to split that into four equal parts. The easy way to do that is to guess where the middle is, make a mark, and then split that in half, and then split the upper part in half as well. That should be roughly four equal parts, roughly. Now that we've done those marks, we can actually begin to put the eyes, the nose, and the mouth in. So the first thing to do is to put the eyes in. Now, it's always um, a question asked of me, how large do we make the iris? Usually I make the iris, which is the first circular part of the eye that we draw, about the same size as if I were to put a circle between these two points that I've made earlier. So if you can draw a circle just very lightly, or imagine a circle, and then draw that circle here, using this as your middle point, and again here. And try and just keep an eye left and right, right and left, just to make sure that they are the same size and shape. And just make them very circular. You can actually colour them in with a medium grey for now with your pencil. That will be our iris. And since we don't need this circle anymore, we can actually rub it out. Now we've got those, um, the decision is how wide do we make the eye? Because our next part is going to be a slow curve to create the eyelid. I usually take from this point to this point and put a marker between them halfway and the same on the other side, halfway between here and here. And that will give us the width of our eyelid. So the next thing to do really is to join these two points with a slow curve and the peak of that curve doesn't reach the very top of the circle we've made, but just a little way down, somewhere between halfway from this line to the top of the circle, around there. And there's our slow curve. And do the same on the other side. Make your marks. It depends, of course, when you look at different iconographers, which you prefer. The steeper you make it, the more awake and alive the saint will look. And the shallower or the, the, the more squashed that line is, perhaps slightly um, more sleepy, the saint will look. So once we've done that line, we're going to add another line, starting from the same point and reaching just above the top of the circle and back down. And that will be our actual eyelid. It reaches to the top there and comes back down. You can see that that line is steeper than the first curved line that we created. And again, just try and look right and left, left and right, just to make sure those lines are, are symmetrical. Now, once you've done that, I actually want you to take this point and make a vertical line downwards and this point and make a vertical line downwards, trying to make sure that they're the same distance from the middle line. You can do that with a ruler or you can do it freehand. Once you've done that, that will help us decide actually how wide our nose and our mouth are going to be. I'm just going to move this line slightly this way, this line slightly this way, just to make sure they're the same distance from the, from the middle point. Okay, once you've done that, I want you to actually extend the width of this line and the width of this line, and we'll start actually by doing the nose. Now, the line you made is actually going to be our guide for our nostrils, and below that line is where we're going to do the, um, the sort of pointy part of the nose. So we'll take it from around the middle point here, to pointy part of the nose and back up again and then we're going to use these flat lines that we've made just extend them by making them a bit darker and we're not actually going to go to the very edge of these lines we're going to stop a little bit short and just do two small nostrils like that 
then of course we can rub out this unnecessary blob that we've got here. We don't need that anymore. And if we take the mouth, we're actually going to just make it a slightly smiley mouth by turning up the edges like this. And you can see I'm going slightly outside these side lines when I do the turn up. So I'm going to turn up, bring it down to the middle, and the same on the other side. Turn up at the edge and down in the middle, just for a very small, subtle smile. And then the lower lip is going to start around the side of these lines. It's going to be a very curved part, then flatten out near the middle and curved again near the edge. And the top lip is going to start again from this line and end in this line. And it's going to try and be a little bit thinner than the bottom lip. If you want, you can make your mouth ever so slightly wider than that. I'd say that's about as wide as you want to make it, really. Once you've done that, we can actually start to put the eyelid, eyebrows in. Sorry. And what we'll use is this marker we've got here. And we'll draw a horizontal line across that marker all the way across the circle. And what we'll do is, if you imagine how wide these eyes are by just doing a very faint line up the sides of the eyes, you can see how wide the eyes are. And I want you to draw this same shape, this same curved line that we first drew for the eyelid, starting here, finishing by touching the line and coming back down again. And the same on the other side. And once you've got those two eyebrows and you just make sure that they're symmetrical as much as you can, take the ends of the eyebrows here and here and just extend them slightly and finish them off with a very fine tip like that. Just extend them slightly and finish them off with a fine tip. And then we're going to actually thicken the eyebrows near the top, not starting from here, but just starting from here and getting thicker and thicker. Just like that. Thickest at the top and coming back down to a slightly thinner beginning. You can see I'm going above the line, not underneath. And again, look to your eyebrows left and right and try and make sure that they are symmetrical as best as you can. And once you finish those two eyebrows and they're as symmetrical as you can make them, the next thing we're going to do is actually start to do the sides of the face reaching to down to the chin. Now we've used uh, these markers before just to help us know where to put the eyes. We're going to use these markers now to actually make the sides of the face. So with your ruler or you can freehand sketch it, just use that marker and draw a vertical line up to the eyebrow line down to the bottom of the face and on this side as well, up to the eyebrow line, down to the bottom of the face. And if you could also do a horizontal line across the bottom of the nose, where the nostrils are, that's going to help us decide where to start curving this line towards the chin. We're actually going to start just slightly above, and we're going to start curving in until we reach the chin here. A slow gentle curve that should reach the side of the face with a curve rather than a point here. Try and make sure it's a nice smooth curve all the way up the side of the face and do the same curve symmetrically on the other side. Doesn't matter if your lines are a bit sketchy at this point because we're going to neaten them up later with a darker pencil. So once you've got that nice shape, which is symmetrical on both left and right, we can actually put the earlobes in. 
Now we're going to just make a small fish hook shape like that for an earlobe, and the same on the other side. Just try and make sure that they're both symmetrical. And once you've done that, we can actually start putting in the hair and the neck to really make use of this circle that we've drawn for the full face. We're going to take this mark here and we're going to do a curve that goes down slightly and then upwards slightly here in one clean curve like this. And the same on the other side. important thing is to keep checking if it's symmetrical. Is this distance the same as this distance, roughly? If you need to amend one of your lines to make sure it is, that's okay. And once you've done those two lines, where this vertical line meets this part of the hair, just go inside a bit and we're going to do another curved line to show another piece of hair falling down onto the face like this. You'll note that it's not actually parallel to this one, it's a different angle from this one. And then we're going to take this vertical line, just darken it a little bit where it reaches the ear, and then we're going to imagine a piece of hair falls on top of the ear to cover the rest of the ear, because at the moment we're only seeing the lobe. But of course, if there wasn't hair falling to cover the ear, we'd see the rest of the ear as well. So we're just going to put a little bit of hair here. And then we're going to do the same on the other side. And now we've got the general gist of the hair. We're going to put some more strands of hair in. But first, we'll just make one or two more shapes. A clean shape there and one shape there. And finally, we'll put the strands of hair in, the thin strands. Two strands in that shape. Two strands in that shape. And when we do the strands in here, we're actually not going to follow this line. We're going to follow this line. We're going to be parallel with this line. Like that. And the same with this. We're going to be parallel with this line. Down and flick. Down and flick. Now that we have the general hair, we can put in the neck. Now the neck depends, or the thickness of the neck depends on whether it's a male or a female saint. A male would have a generally thicker neck. I'd usually go between here and here, about a third of the way in, and start around there. For a young man like Christ when he was 12 in the temple. So that would be about here. Of course, a young man has a similar neck to an older woman. So just keep that in mind when you think about how thick your neck is going to be. And just make sure that they are symmetrical, these shapes. You can see it's a slightly leaning line and then it curves out slightly at the end. It's not a perfectly straight line and it's not a huge curve at the end, just a very minor curve. And then we're going to take the edge of the hair and imagine that it starts falling down towards the shoulders before we finish it, we're going to actually draw some shoulders in. Now the shoulders don't start here, and they don't start here, they start right in the middle. Start to do a diagonal straight line, and then start to curve it gently to make shoulders there. And the same on the other side. Once you've done all those lines, we're actually going to just Pretend, as I said, that the hair is going to fall onto the shoulders and when it reaches the shoulders, it starts to bunch like this. And little bunches of hair. And now that we have all the hair in, we can actually start to rub out the lines that we didn't need, we don't need anymore. Like these vertical and horizontal lines. You can start rubbing them out now with an eraser, a small one like I have on the end of my pencil or a large one. Once you've rubbed out the majority, of the lines. I'm just going to finish off the hair by doing a few more lines here, showing the direction of the hair flow. And 
And finally, if you'd like to, you can actually start putting in a little bit of shadow to show where the light is falling on the face. We usually start by putting a bit of shadow gently underneath the eye. The eyebrow there will have a bit of shadow falling underneath it. And on the side of the face, because we want to make it look as though the light is shining from the middle of the face outwards. So the sides of the face would be a little bit shadowy. You can even use your finger just to smudge it slightly and soften the shading. Now when it comes to this area of the nose, we actually create a very subtle V shape here. You can see it touches the two ends of the eyebrows. And I'm going to just gently draw in an oval shape at the bottom of the nose here. And I'm going to put two lines and join them to this oval. And join them to the V. And then either side of those lines up to this vertical line that I had before. I'm going to put a bit of shading there. Again, you can smudge it a bit. Then take your eraser and just clean it up slightly. And even clean up the center where we're trying to put light on the front of the nose. What I need normally do actually is add a little bit of shadow on one side a bit more than the other. So just Gently add a bit more shadow. Just like that. And then you can just start to amend the lines and make them a bit clearer. The lines that you drew for the nose or the mouth. even the eyes and you can make at this point your irises just a little bit darker if you'd like to your brown eyes and then we can actually add in the pupils which are the same shape as the iris and they start at the top of the iris not right in the middle you can see they go right to the top of the of the eye here. And another pupil here. And just shape your iris to be maybe a little bit more semicircular. And once you finish that, we can actually add some shading in the neck as well. What we're doing is we're actually imagining not just that the, f the light is coming out of the face of this saint, but sort of falling on the neck from this direction as well, which means the light would hit here and this area would be shadow. I'm going to soften it a little bit with my finger. And I usually add a little bit of darkness around the edge of the head as well. I'll add a little bit of pencil shading there and smudge it with my finger just around the edge, outer edge of the hair. just gives a sense that light is shining from the face onto the hair and becoming darker. Sometimes we also put in the line for the bottom of the eye. Now different iconographers make this more or less curved, more or less like a ball. Key is just to make sure that they are symmetrical on both sides, left and right. Try not to make them too dark. Once you've done that, I actually have a darker pencil, which I'm going to use to go around my face and just make some of the areas just a little bit more dark. So I'm going to make the areas of the hair that touch the face 
darker, just the outlines like that. even the side of my face, but not all the way under to the chin, just, just a little bit more towards the chin. And I'll just clean up the shape of my earlobe here. And I'll make the eyelid a bit darker as well, because that will be where the eyelashes are, so it will always appear a bit darker anyway. And even the bottom of my eyebrow, I usually put a dark line to help create a bit of shadow. And sometimes I'll do the same for the nose. And usually the middle line of the mouth where the two lips meet. Down the sides of the neck. And usually the outside of my hair as well. In Coptic iconography, we usually use quite thick outlines because our predecessors, the ancient Egyptians, when they did their paintings, they used very dark outlines as well. So we're trying to make our art look like theirs so that we have a continuity of our artistic style. From then all the way to now, we can be recognised as Egyptian artists. I'm just cleaning up all the smudging that I did with my hand. Thankfully, we have an eraser to hand. And I did a lot of smudging. Just clean up the areas that are supposed to be nice and clean. And there you have it. Um, a simple face. That's how we construct a, a Coptic face in Coptic iconography. Um, as I said, different iconographers do it slightly differently, but this is the general gist of things and how we, how we generally compose the eyes and the nose and the ears and the hair together. Um, the very last thing we do is, if this is a face of Christ, Christ always has a cross in his halo, and that's how we distinguish between Christ and another saint. So there are many ways to draw this cross, but I sometimes take the middle point, line my ruler up to the middle point, and do a diagonal line here, and another one here. So I'll just measure this by eye over here. Line this up to the centre again, and draw a line. That's the first part of the cross, and I'll just shape that in. And I'll do two more here and here by matching my ruler to the middle and drawing this line here and I can actually continue all the way over here and the same on this side. You now have the cross going through the halo of Christ to make sure you can distinguish that this is Jesus and not another saint. Okay, before we go to the next part, could we take a group picture where everyone holds up their masterpiece? It doesn't matter if you didn't finish. I'll send the link for the video in the chat, um, but whatever you have now, so that I could take just a screenshot. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to, okay. Everyone's looks so good. What did I do? Not the job. I didn't do it right. All right, ready? Three, two.
All right, wait, one more because there's a second page to get everyone. Okay, three. Oh, wait. Three, two, one. All right, I got it. And then I will send that uh, link in the chat. Um, but without further ado, Father Theodore, if you give us a spiritual word on uh, Coptic iconography. Sure. Actually, I'm, I was actually, I didn't have my compass or ruler or anything with me, so I didn't get to participate, but those are actually, a lot of those looked really, really, really nice. I was, I was surprised and impressed. <laughs> um, so let's see, uh, can I, let's see, am I going to be able to, yes, I think I can, can share my screen. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about sort of the spirituality of iconography so that, um, kind of have an understanding of uh, basically why is it still relevant for us to use icons today? Why is it important for us, you know, to, to use icons, that sort of thing. Um, I won't take up too much of you guys' time because uh, after all that, you guys are the fun stuff and now, so this is sort of well, maybe the not so fun stuff. So I won't take up too much of you guys' time. Um, but I wanted to sort of go over like sort of what is an icon from a spiritual perspective? You know, Dr. Holman did a wonderful job telling us sort of icons and their reasoning as far as uh, like a historical and, and, and artistic, um, from our historical and artistic standpoint. Um, but I think it's nice um, for us to also kind of think about what, uh, what an icon would mean to us as Orthodox Christians. The word icon uh, simply is, just means image. Um, so it's just like an image of, of something that um, we are uh, trying to portray. Uh, this is an image. I think this might actually be the same one that uh, Dr. Holman had about uh, David. It, it might be, or it might be a, a different one that's also like a, a shepherd uh, icon. Um, when you walk into, as most of you guys know, when you walk into an Orthodox church, you see people uh, touching icons, kissing the icons, praying in front of the icons. Uh, and if you're not used to that, if you're not Orthodox Christian, that can be sort of jolting to, to somebody if you're not really used to that. But Christian images and Christian iconography and things like that are found really early in, in the church, as Dr. Holman kind of uh, let us know. And she also kind of reminded us that it wasn't always universally accepted in Christianity. You know, um, she kind of highlighted sort of there was some periods uh, in the 8th, 7th, 8th century where um, there was uh, some resistance to icons. Um, the reason, the, some of the reasons that people were against iconography is some of the same reasons actually that people are against iconography and the intercession of saints today. And that's sort of, we'll cover that in a, for a couple minutes uh, before we finish today as well. They had the belief that this is sort of a promotion of worship of imagery. Um, but in the Eastern church, uh, in the eighth century, the church kind of finally accepted the use of uh, icons in the Eastern Orthodox church. In Egypt, in the, in the Oriental Orthodox church, in the Coptic church, this was never really something that was controversial. Uh, it was the other parts of the Christian world that sort of battled whether icons should be used uh, or not. So I want to talk a little bit about why why do we as Orthodox Christians use icons? Why is it an important uh, part of our worship? Why is it an important part of our spiritual lives? And there's a lot of reasons uh, that it's a vital life, part of our, our prayer and, and it serves sort of a vital role uh, in the church. Uh, one thing that I think uh, Dr. Holman maybe a little alluded to a little bit is icons teach us our history. Uh, in the early church, we spent, you know, 400 years or so without an official collection of books that we now call the Bible. Uh, and also, even when there was an official collection of books that we call the Bible, there are few, very few copies of scripture. And um, not everybody would have sort of access to it. And even if they had access to it, um, they weren't, uh, most of the people were not literate. So that was a really good way for us to teach um, sort of, here's the life of the saint. Here's what happened with, you know, this is an icon of the crucifix. This is, this is what happened when, when Christ died on the cross. So you might say to yourself, okay, well, that makes sense for those people and why they had it then. But we have a Bible now and we can read now. Uh, so why do we you know, continue to have a need uh, for icons? Um, but even today, we have a, a, a huge contingency of Christians who don't read. <laughs> Maybe not that they don't know how to read, but they don't read. Uh, you know, everyone under the age of five, for example, and basically 90% of Americans, uh, we don't read as, as, as a sort of a practice. And icons teach us the stories of scripture and the lives of the saints the story of salvation, uh, invite us to be a part of that history in a very easy and, and, a, and a very simple way. The other thing too, that's very important for, for us as Orthodox Christians from a spiritual standpoint is icons teach us theology. Uh, icons are not just ordinary paintings. They're full of like symbolic meaning. They're supposed to convey a theological truth of, of faith. They're not just a depiction of 
uh, something that happened in the past. From the colors, to the stances of the people, to the scenery, to the lighting, icons sort of teach us who God is and who we are sort of in relation to him. I put these two, two pictures uh, to sort of compare and contrast. On, on the sort of bottom right is the, the, the picture of a very famous Da Vinci's Last Supper. And then this is a, an Eastern Orthodox icon of, uh, uh, of the Eucharist or of the Last Supper. And you can see the difference. Uh, in Da Vinci's picture, he's sort of trying to realistically portray the moment that Christ says, one of you is going to betray me. And you can see the look on the faces of the of the of the disciples, and you can see that they have like the Passover meal all over the table, and and the the sort of the highlight or or what what Da Vinci is trying to get you to look at is the faces of the people and the reaction to Christ saying that someone one of you is going to betray me. Very very different imagery than what's being tried trying to be taught here theologically in the in the icon on the top right or excuse me top left, the icon on the top left the the centerpiece is really two things, Christ and the bread and the wine, the Eucharist. There's actually no other, there's no other imagery of food on the table. There, even though they were having a meal, there's no other imagery of food on the table. And there's just the imagery of, or centrally the image of Christ instituting the Eucharist. And, and so when, when I see this icon, it's a reminder of Christ instituting to the church, to the disciples who are the symbols or the, 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 the pillars of the church, uh, the Eucharist, giving of himself, his body and blood, and commanding of us to do likewise in remembrance of him. So you can see sort of the difference between what would be like sort of a, a painting that's trying to depict something and, and an icon. So the icon is here to teach us theology. Uh, icons also draw us near uh, to saints. Like we believe in a church that's united over, over space and time. In other words, like the saints that preceded us are just as much a part of the living body of Christ as our own friends and our family. Um, just like we might cherish an image of a loved one who's maybe no longer physically with us, uh, we cherish the images of Christ, the images of his, uh, St. Mary, his mother, and the saints as images of those who we love and who guide us in our lives. The reason I have, uh, this is an outdated photo now because I have to, I have to change my PowerPoint, um, but this is a picture of uh, Andy Reid kissing the Super Bowl after he won the Super Bowl two years ago. The reason I put this here is because uh, for people who are not Orthodox, for people who are not used to iconography, who are not used to veneration of the saints, they they look at sort of when we do things like kiss the icon or or, or venerate the icon and say, like, what are you doing? You know, this is idol worship and that sort of thing. Um, and and sort of, I, I like to use this analogy, you know, when Andy Reid is kissing the Super Bowl, he's not kissing the Super Bowl because he thinks sort of this trophy is a god or, or something like that. He's doing it because it, it represents something. It represents um sort of the effort that he had to put in to win the Super Bowl. It, it, it represents the hard work that his team put in. It represents victory. It represents sort of a lot of things. And so he kisses it out of out of respect and honor for the, the accomplishments that he's made. But in no way he thinks maybe that this, 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 uh, this uh, trophy has any uh, power or meaning in and of itself. And the same thing with the icons. We're never worshiping icons. Um, we're never worshiping, obviously, the saints. Uh, worship is due to God alone. Um, but we are cherishing the person who's close. Another example that I like to give is, I mean, I don't know how many people do this nowadays, but back in the day when you had like uh, somebody who was important to you, uh, maybe like that passed away, especially, uh, you would have a picture of them in your wallet and you might pull out the picture if you miss them and you might look at the picture, you might even kiss the picture. Uh, it's, it's really sort of an, uh, a symbol of how much that person, you care about that person and how much you love that person, how much maybe you look up to that person. So those are some of the reasons why Iconography is important to draw us near to the saints. We see the saint, we see the story of the saint. Dr. Holman talked about how the saints have like imagery that's repeated over and over again so that we can see sort of the type of person they are, the type of life they live, the, the, the unique aspects and characteristics of their life. So drawing near to saints is another important uh, thing of, uh, about icons. The other thing is that icons uh, sort of call us to prayer and call us to the heavenly life. So unlike other forms of visual art, Orthodox iconography is specifically created with prayer in mind. That's why we encourage you know, all of you to have a prayer corner, to make like a little church within your room uh, so that you can have a stillness and a peace about the, 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 the figures, uh, even when they're shown sort of like in action. I, I say that and I, I put these two pictures to sort of compare and contrast again. When you look at the uh, left-hand side and the right-hand side, they're actually depicting the same event, right? They're depicting Christ having the crown of thorns, uh, right after uh, he's been being beaten and on his way to the to the cross, and the the imagery on the left is a picture that is supposed to evoke a lot of image, like an image of or feelings of emotions of like of pain of anguish. You can see on Christ's face 
like the pain that's on Christ's face. You can see the blood running down. It's very, very graphic, you know? Um, whereas on the right, you know, although Christ is doing the same thing, having those same sufferings, you can see a feeling, a, a, a look of a, a, almost like a blank look on the face of Christ, a peaceful look on the face of Christ, because that's not the point of the icon. The point of the icon is to call us to prayer, to remind us of the sacrifice of Christ. This uh, icon in particular is usually called or referred to as Christ the bridegroom. He is offering himself as the bridegroom uh, to uh, his bride, the church, uh, on the cross. And so you can see sort of what is the purpose of these two pictures. The purpose on the left is sort of an evoke an emotion. The purpose on the right is really to, to call us to prayer, to call us uh, to heavenly. That's why uh, I think Dr. Homa mentioned this. I think it was mentioned in the, in the little drawing thing that the, that's one reason icons are not painted realistically. They're meant not to draw us to themselves, but they're meant to sort of draw us beyond the imagery to the heavenly reality that they depict. You know, it's not like other art, and, and it's definitely not like idols. Icons don't allow us to get stuck in the, in the beauty of this world. It calls us to be a part of the world that's sort of transfigured uh, by God's grace and, and by, by God's love. So you can see that sort of in the comparison of, uh, of these uh, two icons here of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to mention just a little bit about opposition to icons, because opposition to icons is not something that was just uh, a problem in the 7th and 8th and ninth centuries, but actually it's a problem that exists uh, today. There are a lot of Christian denominations that have a big problem with uh, icons and the use of icons in, in worship. And, and one of the best ways that they like to refute the use of icons is by this uh, verse that I think Dr. Holman also had on her, uh, on her slides. Shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Shall not bow down to them or serve them. So you can see that God's emphasis of the people is that they would not bow down or serve other images. Paganism obviously was rampant during the time of the Israelites, and God is warning them to that worship is, worse, is reserved for God alone. But this actually doesn't mean that no images were ever made. So the two pictures that I have here on the right are examples that God ordained of imagery to be used by the Israelites. Okay, In the book of Numbers, God himself commanded Moses to make a serpent out of a bronze to save the people, and it became actually a, a prefigure of, of the cross. Uh, it says, and as Moses lifted up, and this is from the Gospel of St. John, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Also in the Old Testament, we read about how God commanded Moses to build an Ark of Covenant with a two golden cherubim on top of it. These images of the cherubim are not a violation of the second commandment, because the aim was not to worship the angels represented by these images, but rather they are supposed to call us to the attention of God, whom the angels praise and who the archangels worship, like we say in our liturgy. So we never, to be clear, we never worship icons or saints. Worship is reserved for God alone, but rather we venerate them because when we honor the saint, we honor Christ, who they followed in their lives. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's basically uh, about icons. Actually, we usually, so like at the end of our, uh, the end of my talk, usually, we, this, is, uh, this is an icon that we used, I think maybe last year or the year before to actually draw. And I, so I like to go a little bit of describing sort of the icons and, and how we draw and the imagery and, and, and things like that. This is the icon of St. John the Baptist. It shows some of the elements of some of the things that we were talking about uh, earlier. So like, for example, we see him, St. John the Baptist is holding uh, a head and he's holding a head because he was beheaded. But even though he's holding a head being beheaded, he also has a head on his, on, on his body. And so it's, it's, it's kind of like what I was telling you. Is the purpose of this is not to show a realistic depiction of St. John the Baptist, you know, before or after his beheading. The, 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 the concept of this is to show St. John the Baptist and to remind the people of his sacrifice. And, and one of the things, too, is that when we always depict the saints as victorious, that's why the, the background usually is gold. And even when they are saints who were martyrs and who were uh, tortured or mangled or, or beheaded in the case of St. John the Baptist, we show them as whole because it, we believe in, in the heavenly kingdom, they'll be whole once again. And so that's why uh, we have the imagery of uh, St. John the Baptist here with his head severed on a platter and at the same time, uh, his head uh, attached to his body. Uh, also, you can notice that uh, St. John is uh, depicted with wings. Why do we, as uh, when, we're, when we're drawing St. John the Baptist, why do we put wings on him? Obviously, St. John the Baptist, I'm pretty sure, did not walk around with wings. So it's not sort of meant to be an accurate depiction of who St. John the Baptist was or what he looked like. Nor in the Gospels does it mention anything about St. John having wings. So why do not iconographers depict him that way? What other type of 
creatures have wings, angels. And what's the main function of angels? To be messengers of God. And St. John the Baptist was the ultimate messenger of God because he was coming before Christ to preach the like as a forerunner to of Christ preaching the good news. That's why he's depicted with wings in his iconography. And then at the, la at the last thing, he's wearing wool or rough clothing to sort of depict his ascetic lifestyle that's mentioned in the Gospels. So I hope this gives you a little bit of a, a concept or idea of Coptic iconography from a spiritual standpoint, the importance of having that uh, like in the church and actually personally in your own home uh, to, to feel a closeness to the saints, to draw myself into an environment of prayer, to teach me theology, to teach me history. Uh, those are the kind of things that we're looking for or that we're looking at uh, when we're talking about icons. Uh, I just, as uh, closing, I just want to say thank you to uh, Abuna Jerome uh, for inviting me and allowing me to uh, to speak and uh, and to have this event. Uh, Abuna Jerome is uh, doing a wonderful job with OCCM and uh, I'm really proud of all the accomplishments that, that they've done. And I am going to uh, ask Abuna Jerome to uh, say some closing remarks and maybe close for uh, with us in prayer. Abuna Osek is more senior. Now, I know, I know. That's why I am ordering yeah. you to pray. <laughs> oh no, okay. <laughs> Abuna, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Homan. Thank you, Abuna Th Theodore. Thank you, uh, our evangelism committee team, Tony, Mariam, Monica, uh, Angela, and Christina. Thanks everyone for uh, what an innovative way to uh, get us all together and learn more about our um, how we live the faith in the Coptic Orthodox Church and how we pray through our icons and how we relate and connect with them. So, I really appreciate all the effort that was put uh, by everyone to make this happen and coordinating the schedules and, and for everyone that attended, obviously, I hope everyone learned and, and benefited. I certainly did from Dr. Homan's um, lecture and from Abuna's and I'm not uh, an artist, sadly, so I did not uh, attempt too much to do this uh, just because no one, I know what the product at the end will come out like. So not to disappoint myself, I did not really attempt. So. Uh, Thank you so much, um, everyone. And Abuna, are you sure? Yes, please, Abuna, be a blessing. <laughs> okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto you, Lord, for the blessing that you bestow upon us. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us in your name. We thank you, Lord, for the blessed people that you put in our lives um, and to educate us and enlighten us, such as Dr. Homan and, and, and Father Theodore, and for the wonderful team, O oh Lord, that has labored to put this event together. We ask you, Lord, to continue to nurture us and strengthen us in the faith and to um, always help us to be proud of who we are and our orthodoxy and uh, our faith and everything that we do, Lord, in, in the church and, and in our faith to worship you so that we may be proud of it and be able to explain it to others around us who may ask us about it. We ask this, Lord, through intercessions of the Holy Mother of God, Mary and Archangel Michael, St. John the Baptist and the prayers of St. Dinamis the Blind, the patron saint of OCCM, make us worthy, Lord, to pray to you and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as you forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine the kingdom and the power and the glory for I want to ask uh, to do the benediction. Please. But there looks like there's other priests somewhere. I see Abuna Daniel, maybe Abuna Simon. Someone else can do this. <laughs> <laughs> so Abuna said, go ahead, because I don't know. If in the love of God the Father, the grace of the God, Son of the Lord God, and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and the flesh of the Holy Spirit with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. Thank you, Abuna. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Dr. Holman. <laughs>